Um, one of the things that we've been doing this year is the first Sunday of the month, I've been preaching through the Apostles' Creed, okay? So we have finished about God, and that had about two lines. Then we came to Jesus, and that had about four lines. And today we come to the Holy Spirit. And the way it works is this. With God, the Apostles' Creed emphasize a lot about what he had done in preparing the world, sustaining the world, getting all things ready, and addressing all mankind. Then, with Jesus, we have an emphasis on how he brought us salvation, right? And so that's a very narrow slice of time. Now, with the Holy Spirit, and the Apostle Creed just has, I believe, in the Holy Ghost. But everything that follows has to do with after Jesus. And in a sense, the Holy Spirit is the God of today. Not to say that God the Father and God the Son are not involved, but those things that are attached to the rest of the Apostles' Creed, they relate especially to how the Holy Spirit is at work in the world. Okay, so you got the three divisions. Today, therefore, I'd like to go in and I'd like to talk about the Holy Ghost, or, and that's old English. Now we more often say Holy Spirit. Okay, so, um, you know, I go forward into life alone, but not alone. Can you figure out what I'm saying by that? I go forward into life alone, but not alone. What I'm saying is this. I go with the additional presence, some very special presences. Is that a legitimate word, presences? I carry with me the presence of my parents. The things that I learned from my mother, from my father, the things, the example, the stuff that they modeled, you know, the places in which they helped me to learn, to grow, to discern, I carry that with me. I go forth into life not only with them, I go forward into life with the presence of my wife. Because ever since I have known her, she has impacted me. She has adjusted me. Sometimes on purpose, sometimes not on purpose, right? Women, that's your favorite all-time hobby, even better than shopping for shoes, to change your husbands, to modify them. Um, so, so I go forward with it, and I go willingly, because I know many of the things that I gained in my home were not adequate for this larger world. And so I let her, and I listen to her. Sometimes I'm stubborn, and I won't go along with the changes. Other times, I instantly see, you know what? I should have known better. I'm glad she was there to show it to me. Okay? So, um, anyway, some of you may have the same kind of sense of presence of people who were influential. Some of you, it might have been your, what, nanny, if you grew up in Asia, for some of you, the most potent influence, the most continuous influence in your life was that old woman who took care of you and became for you both mother and father. Some of you may have gone to school and you had that professor that was so influential. So many books, Dead Poets Society, uh, Mr. What's his name's Opus. Uh, so many movies have paid tribute to powerful, powerful teachers who have transformed our lives and shown us direction and purpose. I remember in junior high school, first day of homeroom, Mr. Stephan, my homeroom teacher, never taught us a single class, but he was our homeroom teacher. He says, and I want you guys to 
change one thing. When I'm talking to you and I'm pointing out something, don't give me that who me stuff. <laughs> okay? I go, oh, okay. Uh, that made a change in me. In a sense, we all have the very best presence in the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Because when I took from my parents what they had to offer, I got a lot of bad stuff too, okay? I got my father's inability to handle emotions. Now I'm gonna have to learn from my wife to counteract all of that, you see? So even an ideal professor, some of the great preachers that I have allowed to influence my life, they were what? People too. And so they had issues. They had problems. I just recently, I grew up and the most powerful voice in my generation during college years was Francis Schaeffer. And now I've learned some things about Francis Schaeffer and it really, wow. And yet when I say wow, despite all those negative things, yet he was able to press forward because we're still what Paul says, I have not yet attained, but I keep pressing forward. And that's the whole idea. But we don't have to do it alone. We do it with the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God in us for this time. And that's the thing you want to remember. God in us, not with us. He is with us, but even more powerfully, he is God in us and for this time as we go forward. So I'm going to talk about who is the Holy Spirit, then I'm going to talk about what he does, and then I'm going to talk about us cooperating and participating with the Holy Spirit so that we can have that benefit, okay? And the first thing is the Holy Spirit is fully God and a deeply personal God. The word I repeated twice is the word what? God, okay? Fully God and a deeply personal God. Each week when I give the benediction, who do I mention during the benediction? Do I mention the Father? Do I mention the Son? Do I mention the Holy Spirit? Okay, all three are encapsulated in that. All three of them working differently, but all three are God. Turn with me to the last verse, to the very end of Matthew, Matthew 28. See, we can get ourselves messed up if we only pay attention to the world. I remember there was a very famous Academy Award winning movie that came out, and the title was very impactful. It was impactful even for those people who never saw the movie. The title was Children of a Lesser God. So there are greater gods and lesser gods. And I'm afraid that although the Holy Spirit and his whole attitude is he's in the background, okay? The Holy Spirit operates in the background. He's here to highlight whom? Not us, but Jesus Christ. And you remember Jesus talking. He said, who was Jesus here to highlight? The Father. Okay, and so who's there to highlight the Holy Spirit? Well, we only have a trinity. Well, the answer is us, but we don't do such a good job. So he becomes the neglected person of God very often. And so as you look at Matthew chapter 28, I want you to look at the Great Commission. Now, in, now, how are we to, ex, to give 
and express the authority of God. In whose name do we go? Josiah, thank you. Did you notice the word name? What's peculiar about that? Singular or plural? Yeah. One God, one name, all the same. And so as you go through the Bible, wherever you see something great being done, whether it's creation or resurrection or anything, you'll see that all three gods are present. All three of God is present. And uh, so this happens throughout. Uh, So he is fully God, okay? Um, Now, turn with me to John. That's our passage for this morning. I'm going to begin to read John 14, verses 16 and 17, just those two verses. Jesus is ready to leave. At the beginning of the chapter, after that he's told them that he's going to be leaving, he says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to be back. Okay? And then he comes to this. He says, and this is what I'm going to do. I will ask the Father, and he will give you what? Another helper to be with you. How long? Forever. All right? And who is this? The Spirit. And then he qualifies it, the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive. Okay? Um, At the end, it says, you know him, for he dwells with you, with, and furthermore, be in you. He is with us, but he is in each one of us. You get it? So he's in our presence, but he is also a part of us. Now, the word another, you cannot appreciate because the Greeks had several words for another. The word here is alas. The other Greek word is etero, okay? Like heterosexual. Alice, the special distinctiveness of this is it takes the word another, but he makes it another of the same kind. Okay? Now, I can send to get you help, to to keep you company. I can send my wife. Or I can send our family dog. Now, which one is more like me? My wife. Jesus, when he said another, he meant that this would be just like him. So what you need to do is always realize that this person, this third person of the Trinity who's coming along, he's going to be acting as God. He's going to be the same as Jesus, and he's going to pick up what Jesus has been doing. He's going to be finishing what Jesus has done. He's not just a helper, but he is fully God, and he's going to do the same thing. The other thing you notice that seems to be so easy is the Holy Spirit is never spoken of as an it. Always says he and him, you see? So the Holy Spirit is a person. And we need to just clarify that because a lot of people think of the Holy Spirit like fire, like water, like wind, starting to sound like some of Chinese thinking, right? Well, here's the other one that we think about in America. May the force be with you. And don't let it be the dark side of the force. Okay? It isn't like that. Okay? It isn't like a five-hour energy drink. It's like when I'm cooking and my wife comes along and she helps me, 
right alongside. And she's doing some of the work. The Holy Spirit is talked about, and it talks about his love, his outrage, and the fact that he can be grieved, that he can be hurt. And so as a person, he comes to us in a relationship. Now, earlier when we were reading the passage, the second passage where Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit, um, and, and all of his people are feeling very bad to know that Jesus is going to be gone. John 16, 7 says this, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage, other translations, for your good that I go away. Well, what's the difference between having Jesus with us as the apostles had and having the Holy Spirit in us as we do today? What's the advantage? As Jesus was there in person, he could only be with how many people at a time? Yeah, the people at the same locale. One to one or one to a group. The bigger the group, if you're in the back, you know, problems. You're with him, you know, but you're not really there. Instead now, he comes and he is with us and he is with us forever. In fact, Romans 8 and 9 says that if you don't have the Holy Spirit in you, you're not really a believer. And so we need to think of him as a person who wants to relate to us. And that's very important for how to get him in <clears throat> our lives fully. The Greek word for helper is paraclete. Okay, that's the Americanized version of it. But it's made of two words. Cleat part is called. Para, alongside. Okay? So this Holy Spirit, this helper, is somebody who's called to come alongside and to help us. Um, if you read in your English translations, sometimes they won't see helper. You'll see what are some of the other words that you may have remembered if you have some Bible or Christian background. Can you think of some of the words? Oh, don't worry, it'll be all right. Comforter, little clue there, all right? Um, second one, this way, this way. I'll tell you how to do it. Counselor, okay? And the last one is what I used to be in my former life. No, not lawyer. Advocate. Advocate. Okay? Those are the three popular translations for it. As a comforter, remember those guys were really getting distressed. Jesus is leaving. He's come to give peace. But not just regular peace, the peace that overcomes and helps you to break through situations, especially uh, simple things that come to us every day. I still remember the first time I was called to do a wedding. You thought I was having trouble speaking now? That day, I could barely squeak out a word. I was so scared, okay? I have seen people in the courtroom, and I would ask them, please, first line, right? You give them something to get them started. Give us your name. And they are so scared, they forget their name. It happens to us. And one thing about moving forward in life is we are going to encounter new things. So it isn't just when we feel hurt. But this comfort comes as a power through peace so that we can overcome different things. Uh, see, and I'm going to give you all three of them together because they kind of, we can separate them out to think of them clearly, but they really do operate very much 
working together. Because when he comes and he is our advocate, we have a strong lawyer defending us, okay? Then we feel comforted, right? You like to have somebody with you when you go into different situations. Well, what happens is this. When we talk about Jesus as our advocate, he's, I mean the Holy Spirit, he's doing something mirroring what Jesus is doing in heaven because the Bible says Jesus is in heaven advocating with the Father on our behalf. So then, what does that leave the Holy Spirit to do? Well, where is he? He's not with the Father. He's with whom? He's with us. And as he's with us, he's advocating this to us. Jesus says, Father, for all their sins, I have died. So, they are not to be on trial. No double jeopardy, no double indemnity. In our hearts, what the Holy Spirit does is this. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. Do you have in your memory guilt? I do. I remember some of the stupid things that I've done in my life. And sometimes when I think of it and it comes to my mind, I'll slam my hand on the steering wheel. It's still that strong with me. Because it's human to do some really dumb, embarrassing, hurtful things. And the Holy Spirit is taking it and it's like medicine. And he's saying, Ken, let it go. By my power, I'm going to help you to let go of this guilt and to move past these things so that you're not always stuck. You know, and I have some friends who have made mistakes. I've known people who have gotten divorced. I've known people who have had criminal records. I've known people who are homosexuals. I've known all kinds of problems that they've had. And you know, if they stay stuck in those parts of their lives, they can't move on. And the Holy Spirit speaks to us inside of us. The other thing that he does is he's a guide, and I think that that's very evident. Um, when it came time for Jesus to leave, he was about to go. And so he's meeting with his apostles one last time. And he's ready to release them to fulfill the Great Commission, but he gave them one last piece of advice. In Acts chapter 1, Verse 8, and he tells them to wait. Why? He says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses. And so the Holy Spirit will come, and he is going to be that source of power for all of us, and then we can move on. We can have peace. We can know comfort. Uh, we can uh, not be racked with guilt, and ultimately, we can change. The most powerful, powerful story about that comes at the very next few chapters of Acts, where Peter, the guy who denied Jesus three times and has a lot of guilt to live with, right? After boasting, even if everybody else quits, I will not. And three times he failed. He's walking through the streets. And he gets arrested. And the Sanhedrin pull him into court. And this is, by what authority do you say these things? And he says, by God's command, by God's word, he says, you know what? You choose. Should I listen to God? Or should I listen to you? And you read that and you say, what a perfect comeback. Just like Jesus would have spoken. Right? Well, that's the Holy Spirit working in them to answer the accusers just the way Jesus always used to answer the accusers. And at that point, the Sanhedrin says, you know, they muttered a few things and they let them go. And the other thing is, as they were walking on that street that day, they came across this man 
who was, bla- uh, who was um, uh, lame. And the guy is asking for money. And you remember Peter's famous reply? Silver or gold have I none, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus. And the man was healed, and he got up, and he walked forward. Didn't have any money, but he had that power of the Holy Spirit within him. So we see this immediately happening. Well, there's a woman named Norina who lived in South Florida. This is a true story. You can look it up in the internet. And what happened was this. She got hit with a hurricane. She got hit with a hurricane, and it destroyed her house, and she got her insurance money, and she tried to rebuild. But she had an unscrupulous contractor. He messed things up. The job wasn't done. The money was gone. So guess what? She lived with that situation for 15 years. See, you can tell I'm not talking about Hurricane Katrina. I'm not uh, talking about, um, what's the other one that happened just before Katrina? Yeah, this one goes back to Hurricane Andrew. 15 years she's living without this. Her neighbors finally realized what was going on. No lights over there, okay? And they called the authorities. The authorities came in, okay? And this is, this isn't right. So they brought in a guy, a contractor, he donated his time, and he fixed up what was left undone. And finally, she got to the point where she was able to flip a switch and turn on her power again. You know, all that time, she says, I had dread of going in for my morning shower. You guys ever take cold showers? You know? You go in there, you jump in, and you let out this howl, right? And you're shivering, and you've got more to watch because you're not only washing your regular skin, you're rubbing all those goosebumps too, okay? Anyway, for all those years, she would dread it. And finally, when her power was turned on, she says the thing that she wanted to do was to turn up the power, get the water really hot, and take her first bubble bath in a decade and a half. Quote, it's hard to describe having the electricity to switch on. It's overwhelming. See, a lot of us neglect the Holy Spirit. He is there. He's ready. He's willing. He's able to help. You call upon me, and I'd be willing but I might not be ready. I might be ready, but I might not be able. But the Holy Spirit, who resides in us, the portable God, is always able to do it. And the thing is, it doesn't have to be spooky, all right? In some churches, they'll tell you, you got to do this, you got to do that. And I'm telling you that he is here, and if you would just step forward, it will be supplied. He will help. He's going to do whatever's right to get us trained, to get us to be able to be growing and capable. Um, Did I make it through that wedding? Yeah. Eventually, you know, I got into the sense of the wedding. And the Holy Spirit made me present for the couple so that I forgot about my fear and I was able to rejoice with the people in front of me And pretty soon, you have one happy camper, one happy pastor doing a great wedding. And afterwards, the people say, you were so happy. We were blessed just to see your face. So I had gone from the guy who couldn't even squeak out, dearly beloved, to a guy who was a blessing just from the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through. And that's the Holy Spirit. So, do you believe in the Holy Ghost? We should. We need to just keep him in mind and act accordingly, and he'll take care of it. Let's pray. Father, thank you.
for your greatness, for how you supply. Give us the wisdom and the maturity to be attentive to your voice, to always be thinking about you, to let you be our guide. Bless us always, in Jesus' name, amen.